Well, good evening, everyone. Saturday Night Live and Rambling, soon to be joined by the lovely Miss Gracious Ellen. She's having trouble with her uh, with her sound, so she is restarting and going to log on here shortly. <laughs> so, you know, something about technology just is not our friend. Let's see if this works. There she is. Can you hear me now? Nope. Can't hear a thing. <laughs> All right. Well, I can hear Ellen. Can y'all hear me? Can you guys hear Ellen? Clay? Because I cannot hear him. Yeah, this, you know, it shows my mic is working on the test and everything. So shows her mic is working, but somehow she's not receiving the sound. <laughs> There's something in the attic, by the way. Okay, well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, let me take the chance to say, hey, good evening, Pancake. Good evening, Melissa and Sky. I hope your son is kicking anatomy on the hockey rink. So, hope everything is, is going well for y'all. And Brentwood, good to see you. Glad, uh, glad to have the family back together. It's, uh, it's been a good, good Saturday, good weekend. Actually, Ellen is coming downstairs, so <laughs> you know that's that's a great way to start off a show. Got something up in the attic. I can't hear you, but there is something wrong in the attic. So I'm going to go check that out. Here, let me go check it out. All right. Well, Ellen will be back with us shortly. She is going to go check out the uh, the noise in the attic. So this ought to be, a, be an interesting event. <laughs> Um, we're going to do things a little bit different. We usually start off with a, you know, a little bit of a commentary on the market, but thought it would be better to start off with the, with the main subject. Sometimes we kind of get lost a little bit in the details. So tonight we were talking about the 4% rule and other things to ignore. You know, in, in, and some of you possibly have been to, you know, financial planners. they oftentimes will give advice or suggestion based on, you know, in some cases, what benefits them the most. Uh, some, you know, agents receive commission on the products that they place people in, and some products pay a much higher commission than others. They are incentivized. <laughs> and some will rec make recommendations based off of ratios or standards that they saw or have heard or whatever, but they really don't have a strong idea of the basis or origin of it. So tonight, we're going to try to remove some of that veil of secrecy. We're going to try to help you understand and make decisions that are better for you and your family. Now, <laughs> in terms of Ellen running around the, uh, the attic here, is it the ghost of Christmas past? That's cute. But no ghost here. The house is relatively new, so we don't have ghosts yet unless we're, you know, built the house on an Indian burial site or something like that. Old pirate's grave. Melissa, maybe it's Clark Griswold from <laughs> Christmas Vacation. Y'all will be pleased to know I did watch A Christmas Story with Ellen. Promised I would, and I did it. So now I understand about the Red Rider. 200 shot Daisy miracle, kill all the burglar weapon thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm a little bit more educated and suave than I was last week. So hope that's a, you know, some encouragement there. 
I'm just curious as hell what's going on on up in the attic. <laughs> you just never know. All right. Well, let's, you know, let's start off with a little attitude. <laughs> I got to answer this one. Was it torture to watch it? Torture may not be the best word, <laughs> but it wasn't exactly down my alley. So, you know, I do want a leg lamp for Christmas, but that has been on my list for decades. Don't know why. Don't know where I first saw it. But I always thought that was just a cool thing. I didn't know it came from this movie. So, you know, I'm kind of rethinking my desire. <laughs> Don't know if I want to be associated the rest of my life with the, you know, Red Rock Rider 200 BB gun, kill all the burglar daisy thing. It was just, it was cheesy. There were some parts that made me, made me laugh. Melissa, the best, or that came from the movie. From the movie electric sex glowing in the window <laughs> there were a couple of good comments out of the out of the flick i gotta admit <laughs> yes definitely your peer pressure worked also making me promise i am generally prone to try to keep my word now Retirement. This is kind of a, a uh, tough topic. I know, you know, some of you who watch it are, are nearing retirement. Some of you, many of you are struggling with the current, you know, economic situation or other issues. And I understand many are in, you know, possibly dire financial situation now. You see rents are soaring. Uh, statistic came out, a number of people are paying 50% or more of their income for rent or mortgage. You see where people are using high rate credit cards just to get by. Uh, defaults on car loans are soaring. Home defaults probably aren't far behind. Some people are losing their jobs. We can't fix that, but we do want to offer some encouragement. I, I remember in the 70s, as horrible, um, you know, I was young, but as horrible economically as that decade was. All right, Ellen, what's the story? She still can't hear me. Ellen, what's the story? Ellen is still without sound. And she still. I'm trying everything I can. Well. Maybe sometime tonight she will update us on what she saw or didn't see in the attic. So back to uh, back to the topic. You know, I know bottom line is we know a lot of people are suffering. You know, some are losing their jobs, but we want to offer some encouragement. Um, remember in the 70s that as bad as those economic times were, you still had companies like Microsoft, Apple, um, Dell, Cisco, Intel. All those companies were started in the late 70s. So even when times are economically bad, there is still always hope. Or we always want to encourage hope. I remember the, uh, you know, mentioned before I'm Scottish, Moffat clan. And the motto of the clan is we always hope. When I first heard that, I thought that was kind of a little silly, but I've become a big believer of it down through the years. People without hope 
just are angry, frustrated. I think that's a big problem with the inner city issues. And so, you know, we want to encourage people where we can, however we can, um, to never lose hope. And having that approach, that attitude, helps you in not only handling the circumstances, but both in practical and financial decisions. You know, they're often a matter of attitude. And so saw this little video and thought it would be a great place to start. Now, this is from, it's Kevin Bond uh, Instagram site. So want to give him credit. It's Kevin Bond. And just take a few seconds and, and listen to this for us. Old guy living in a shack is watching me. And he comes up and says, kid, I've been, I've been watching you. He said, you're not catching anything, right? I said, no. He says, because you're doing it wrong. You can't catch any fish unless it's a falling tide. And that's when the tide is going out very quickly, mm. rushing out between the rocks. And I'm like, well, all the fish are gone, right? He says, no, no, no. You'll see it's stirring up the plankton. The fish go crazy. It's happening in 45 minutes. He has his fishing pole. We throw our, we throw our lines in and we're pulling them out by, you know, by the tens. It's unbelievable. And, and afterward, he's feeling sort of philosophical. He lights up a cigarette on the rocks. I'm 11 or something. And he says, hey, kid, you know, during a falling tide, you can only make one mistake. I said, what's that? He said, not having your line in the water. And I have learned this, that the time between the tides of your life, the falling tide of your life looks like you're losing everything. Get your line in the water because that's the most fertile period of your life. So what does it mean to have your line in the water? You must try new things. You must be fully alive. You must try everything you possibly can. You must I need you to define fully alive to be to wake up each day and to live that day full of possibility, not to nurse your wounds, not to waste your time, not to try to do things that you used to do. To be fully alive is to be alive to the new set of experiences that's, that's coming across the transom. So the point is it. There's always opportunities and doors opening. Your ability to, to see them, to take advantage of them, is often based on your attitude. So we just we just want to encourage people, you know, even that, you know, every valley has a mountain next to it. And a big part of reaching that mountaintop is being better informed. So let's start off with, you know, how to retire and decisions one has to be uh, has to either make or be aware of. And a brief addendum here, side issue. Ellen wanted me to throw this out. Many in the country are concerned about not having enough to retire on. And this is a big reason why we encourage you to, let's say, encourage your kids once they have a job to start putting $50 away every month, more can as they can. Can you hear me now? Their future selves will thank you, greatly thank you down the road. So as far as where to invest, you can refer to our investing video and learn about investing in mutual funds as Ellen buries her face. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, you're a little distant, but I can hear you. Pull your mic a little closer. I can't. It doesn't work. It's screwing with the uh, AirPods for some reason. I'm trying to, uh, I mean, for fuck's sake, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see, we'll take that out. We'll, take well that while out. Ellen is figuring that can little details me? out there, I, can you hear me you're still very faint. You're not, not very loud, but it's I can hear you. The loudest mic volume I've got. Okay. Um, can y'all hear her? How about now? That didn't change. Maybe you turn your volume up. Um, let me, all right, we'll try that. So let's talk about the 4% rule. 4% rule. If you go to a financial planner, you know, and talk about your retirement, golden dream years, whatever you call them, 
most planners or a number of planners probably should say will suggest that with your retirement savings, you should draw 4% of your accumulated funds in that first year. Hell, there's even one syndicated radio host that says you ought to take 8% per year. Well, long story short, anyone that suggests this generally is uninformed and doesn't know the basis or background of the default recommendation. So let's give you a little background. The 4% rule came from a paper written by three professors at Trinity University. It's oftentimes referred to as the Trinity paper. It was in 1998. It's titled Retirement Spending, uh, Choosing a Sustainable Withdrawal Rate. Well, damn computer. And here's what it looks like. You know, if you want a copy of the paper, let me know. I'll be glad to send it to you. But this is the source, basically, of the 4% rule. Now, they actually are building on the work of a guy who earlier in the 90s did some initial work on this by the name of Bergen. So let's give them all credit. The professors here used historical data to determine ultimately what is a safe withdrawal rate from a portfolio of stocks and bonds over time. How much, you know, can an individual withdraw safely? Well, the 4% rule was one of the alternatives considered by the authors, among others. And the idea was that subsequent withdrawals would be adjusted for CPI or inflation effects. The withdrawal plan was deemed to be a failure in the study if the portfolio was exhausted in less than 30 years. In other words, if it didn't last 30 years, if it went to zero or below. 30 years was just their target number that they used. So uh, the concern was obviously outliving your retirement funds, which is a, you know, a very real concern to a lot of people. Can you hear me now? now? Yes. We're Can good. hear you now. Okay, thank God. I was about to Better. forget it and go home. Yeah. No, we got you. And then we've always got the uh, the sidekick chair here. I know. It's just frustrating when I'm trying to get everything to work. But um, upstairs, it was definitely above my head. Of course, the dogs heard it. They were freaking out. There's nothing Mahoney can get into in her room that is above my head. Um, there is one box that I am not going to look into. It's a big one. It's empty. I see. I see you, Mahoney. Don't know what's going on there, but something is up there. Shouldn't be anything up there. It should be pretty well sealed, but I'll go up there and look after the show and maybe put a trap up there just in case. It, it was not small, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, hey, sweetie. So the concern was outliving your retirement funds. Now, the Trinity study used a um, combination of long-term high-grade corporate bonds, investment-grade bonds, and stocks, primarily an S&P 500 index. So Bergen used intermediate gover government bonds, treasury bonds. So the, the difference or one primary difference in the two studies was that the corporate uh, investment grade bonds yield probably on average 50 to 70 basis points higher, half a percent of interest or three quarters. So the different choice for bonds explains why the worst case scenario for Bergen was a withdrawal rate of 4.15%. But the Trinity study found a 4% withdrawal rate had a 95% success rate. What they did was they took all the, the, the uh, returns from stocks from 1926 through, I want to say, 1997 and 
just pick a series, a, a running series based on those re annual returns for a 30 year life. And then they looked at the 4% withdrawal rate, the 4% withdrawal rate with increases for inflation, and then figured out the percentage of out of all those portfolio combinations, how many would still have assets remaining in the portfolio at the end of 30 years. So with the corporate bonds, the sustainable withdrawal rate dipped below 4% in 1965 and 1966. This led people to hear that the 4% rule with a 95% chance of success, because you only had these two years out of all the years from 1926 to 1997, where the portfolio failed, went to zero. Now, keep in mind that the study uses historical data. Does not imply that today's retirees will enjoy the same chance for success, but there's information there. The key part or the key point is that even though past is not always prologue, the 50s, the 60s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2010s were boom years for the market, which overcame some pretty steep but short-lived crashes. You had the stagflation of the 70s. You had the dot-com crisis. You had the subprime crisis. You had COVID. Um, the 70s you know, had a prolonged economic malaise. But even with the stagflation, the S&P returned 9% over the decade of the 70s. That's not bad. So the key point is, historically, using the data, 4% rule works. But to understand if the 4% rule works for you, again, understand past is not always prologue. In the past, Social Security benefits uh, have constituted maybe 35 to 40 percent of a retiree's income. So, will that hold true for you? You know, how likely is it, do you think, that Social Security payments are cut or increases reduced while you're retired? Often. Yeah, you know, my crystal ball is no better than anyone else's, but personally, I'm thinking it's probably a small to zero chance, particularly if you're near retirement now. Now, if you're 30 years away, all bets are off. Or 20 years but away. That's a gray area. But let's say if you're 15 to 10 years, five years away, I think reasonably you're probably pretty safe unless your income is very high. Now, many retirees, and a big reason for that is many retirees struggle. They're on a fixed income, and cutting the benefits or not adjusting somewhat for inflation would be absolutely devastating to them. Okay, is there a full moon tonight or something? Mahoney is losing her mind. She just shut my bedroom door. She won't stay off the desk. The dogs are downstairs. Things are just haywire today. I am so sorry. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a, I don't know, alternate reality or something. It's very strange. Yeah. If I had the little swoosh thing, I'd probably use it now. Thank you. <laughs> that was a guilt thing that I haven't done one. <laughs> I thought somebody was going to do it, but well, didn't end up having doing it. Yeah, I think she started her own channel and, and got lost. So ultimately, like big I'm point lost, is, yeah. ultimately, big point is that old people vote and in increasing numbers, that age range of the population is increasing. So I think the ratio is safe, particularly, as I said, for those set to retire in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, 
if you're 30, 35 years out, you probably need to plan for a lower percentage of Social Security payments or possibly even no Social Security payments. The math just doesn't work. And we talked about that some previously. Now, to retire, you know, your first step would be trying to have an idea of what your normal monthly expenses will be. Most retirees can live on 60% of their working income. They may, you know, move to a smaller house. The, the idea is simplifying your life. They don't need as much space, et cetera. They don't need to buy dress clothes or uniforms. They don't, um, they probably have their debt paid off or very close to it. Car paid off. Loans, credit cards paid off. Um, they don't eat out, have to eat out lunches, all this kind of thing. So by simplifying their life and their expenses, on average, most retirees will need 60, maybe 70% of their work income to maintain the similar standard of living. Also, when you get older, stuff just doesn't mean as much to you. I mean, when I was young, there, you know, I wanted everything. New furniture, you know, gadgets, toys, whatever. Now, I really don't care, except for knives and guns. But most anything else, I don't need stuff. I'm trying to get rid of stuff, actually. No, you're not. Not really. So, well, I am. I've been by mm -hmm. Salvation Army a few times. Not as rapidly as I, you know, need to, but it's okay. coming. Now, another option, you know, another thing is, you know, when you're at home full time, maybe you can garden more, grow more of your own food. Hell, I encourage everyone to do that if possible for nutritional value as well as, you know, saving money. I think it's just a good personal discipline. You know, the only expense probably increase that you'll have, and I don't even know there'd be an increase, but you'll have to start paying for Medicare. Uh, Plan B, and possibly a supplement. Not cheap. So don't know what you're paying for health care now, but if you have a corporate plan, probably most people will see that cost go up a little bit. So first step, figure out what your nor uh, monthly living expenses will be. Then subtract that from your Social Security income. And you can go on Social Security's website and see an estimate of your Social Security income. So that's your deficit or surplus. Now, we'll assume Social Security isn't enough to cover everything so that there's a deficit. That's what you have to cover out of your savings each month. And at this point, the 4% number is irrelevant. You've got to cover your expenses. So that's where the rubber meets the road. Many of you are conservative. You know, for example, in your investing, investing in stocks, for example, may scare you because of the volatility or the uncertainty of the market. But I want you to understand that there is always risk always risk no matter where you put your money even if you have it in a bank savings account there's always risk that risk is you being able to afford future expenses purchasing power risk you know we've talked about uh the little old redheaded lady and i refer to it as little old redheaded lady problem many of us have gotten a, a good education with inflation over the past couple of years, how the money that we have just doesn't buy as much as it used to, particularly with food, with energy, with clothing, not to mention rent and or mortgage payments. So that's a very real risk. And if the money you save, the return you get on that money after taxes and after inflation doesn't purchase the same goods and services it did previously, well, you've made yourself poor. 
you're forcing yourself to have a lower lifestyle in the future. That's why investment returns matter. And, you know, you have to look at risk that way. That's a very real risk. So if we look, <laughs> and speaking okay. of old Christmas right. movies. Real quick. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> first, I'll see what I did. I put the logo up there at the top right. Oh, yes. Very nice. I figured I would just play around when everyone can hear me, but okay. Brentwood can hear me now. <laughs> Melissa said moon's 20% full waxing crescent. I'm telling you, something is is going on around here in this house. Maybe we've got a haunting. Um, Brentwood, the older I get, the less stuff I want. You know, I wish Clay felt that way. We've got three grills in our garage. Three. We use one. Ellen, you're having trouble with your mic again. Sorry about that. <laughs> we don't we don't lip read. Sorry about that. Ellen's having technical difficulties. No, I'm not. You're just being a Jack hole. <laughs> Brent Wood said, stop it, Clay. She didn't mean it. Thank you, Brentwood. I did. Moffat, you and I are going to have words. <laughs> My turn. I wouldn't want to say anything out of turn. Oh. Continue. I'm going, take, I'm going to take that as a yes. All right. We're talking about inflation. And I saw this. Um, speaking of old movies, it just seemed kind of apropos. For those of you who are fans of Home Alone, there's actually a grocery list that they have to purchase there in the movie. And it costs nineteen dollars and eighty three cents. Nineteen dollars eighty three cents. Understand this movie was filmed in nineteen ninety. Now last year, the same grocery list cost forty four dollars, and this year it cost seventy two twenty eight. Seventy two twenty eight. <laughs> That's. You know, over four years, I mean, I'm sorry, over 30 years since it was filmed, food has increased nearly four times, 400%. In one year, cost of food is up 60%. Okay. Now, Blue, Let me ask you this then. Yeah. How much are wages up since then? In real terms or nominal? Real would be adjusted for inflation. No, nominal. Is is in probably, ratio to food prices? Probably three to four percent on average. All right, so we're paying almost four times in groceries, but the wages haven't gone up nearly as much. Oh, you're talking about since uh, 1998, 1990? Yeah. Um. Or last year would be great. Whatever. Give me a second. In 1990, average income was in constant, this is inflation adjusted dollars, 50,000. I don't Which want. Would be what today? I don't want. Inflation adjusted. Okay. In California, personal income averaged 20,000, 21,000 in 1990. This year, average income is about 65,000. Now, adjusting for inflation. Is this just California because everything there is more expensive? Yeah. California would probably be on the high end. But that gives you a a little bit of an idea. So wages have, um, what did I say for California? 21, 
So wages have maybe two and a half times increased two and a half times. I don't believe that. And Cause then you're saying that it's exactly like the inflation. And I don't, I don't believe that. Wait a minute. Now remember the groceries increased four times. So wages are up two and a half times. So that just the cost of food has grown far more than wages have. Uh, just to give you point. an idea over the last year. Yeah. Give you an idea over the last year, Bloomberg, a huge data provider, ran their own grocery store list mm -hmm. and found the cost for it increased from $238 to $315 in one year, a 32% increase. So there's no doubt that the cost of food is greatly, grotesquely exceeding that of the, the, uh, the increase in wages. So and that's purchasing does, power at risk. How is someone supposed to um, reconcile that with trying to do, excuse me, we had chili this evening that I made last night. Oof. Um, reconcile that with trying to, I'm sorry, I missed the whole first 20 some minutes of the show because I couldn't hear you. How do you reconcile that with um, trying to retire? and try to save for retirement or save for anything, college tuition for your kids. I mean, I don't know how to reconcile it. You just have to accept it. You just have to deal with it. There's just nothing you can do to change it. I mean, people have, have uh, in a sense, mean voted and chosen this. There's no simple answer. There's no easy way to adjust or accommodate it if your wages aren't increasing by 20 or 30% a year. Just no way to. So, you know, most people have had to, you know, cut their lifestyles. The average family, average family making 65000 a year over the past year would need an additional $11,000. Sorry, last two years would need an, an additional $11,000 in income to maintain the same lifestyle. But they're so not that just that. gives you some perspective. Yeah, they're not. And that's why a lot of people are hurting. Hello, Carson. Good to see you, man. I'm looking up a derail to see what in the <laughs> world you're talking about. Well, now that Carson's here. Now, we, off the rails, we know that. What is, what is a derail? Carson, please, because I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> Brentwood, Carson, I Googled a derailing device and was surprised not to see your picture, but the real thing looks cool. What is it? I couldn't, I, I bought a derail. I checked device, derail. Don't know. Oh, here we go. To prevent fouling. Hang on. Can I present? Sure. Um, so this is a derail, apparently. Oh, for train. Took used to prevent second. fouling, blocking, or compromising of a rail track by unauthorized movements of trains or unattended something or other. Huh, I wonder how that works. Uh, it basically throws the train wheel off the track and we'll derail it. Oh, this is an intentional derail. Yeah. Okay. That's to protect people, workers or something downstream or don't know, but that's well, interesting. It is interesting. Come on, Carson, you got to, Changes the railroad tracks. Yeah, but it derails a train. Yeah. That doesn't sound well, like a, a derailing device. Doesn't sound like a good thing. But why would you want to derail? That's always like the, the worst case scenario that the train was derailed. Um, anyway, maybe Carson will explain. Well, if, 
if there is a bridge ahead that's being worked on and it can't bear the load of the train, better to derail the train on land than have it plunge down 200 feet into a river? No, I get that. Stop a runaway train? But like, if there's like a um, a ditch or something and the train just goes sideways after being derailed, that doesn't sound like... A great it's just a, it's just the point when the derailing is a better option than whatever lies ahead. Okay. Okay. So, for example, I work on an industrial rail yard. Here we go. With has oh hazmats. Derail that will keep from we're waiting for the hazmat and spreading it in the air and. You know, across the the area. Does it actually derail the train? Like, is yes, it like Ellen, a, it actually no, derails wait, the train? Would you let me finish the freaking question? Like <laughs> in a subtle manner, or is it just like an abrupt thing? Or I'm just curious. I'm sorry, I don't know enough about these things, but you know, and I look to our. Um, subs to uh oh oh by the way oh carson i got you hang on one sec <clears throat> me too right i can do something oh no you have to do it clay wait i can do that anyway never mind all right well while you're looking i'll go ahead and get back on the okay the idea Moffitt. The we're talking about cost of living, talking about increasing in the cost of items greater than wages. That is purchasing power risk. That's why, long story short, your returns matter. So you have to either avoid that risk or control it. The way to do that is to invest so that your savings over a period of time can at least equal the tax rates plus inflation or hopefully even exceed them. So the market is volatile. It will vary. But over a 5, 10, 15-year period, it's hard to find a time when it hasn't outperformed inflation and taxes. And I'll show you this graph. Uh, an individual at the Poor Swiss ran his own numbers and published some kind of pretty pictures. I love, I love pretty pictures. So here you have the success rate, which is defined by the portfolio, not going to zero over 30 years. You're taking withdrawals. You're starting with the 4% rule. Well, you, you have these different withdrawal rates down here at the bottom, 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%, 12%. And then this side gives you the success rate with 100% being up here, 75%, 50%. So if you look, you have different colored lines. The lines represent the portion in stocks with the remainder in bonds. So uh, the blue line is 100% stocks. The red line is 75% stocks. The yellow is 50% stocks. Green is 25% stocks. Orange is 100% bonds. And if you look at the orange, you can see even if your withdrawal rate is 1%, you've still only got a 75% chance of success. If it's 4%, your chance of success at the portfolio lasting 30 years drops to about 20%. Whereas if you're a you know, 75% stocks, 25% bonds. If you're at 4%, you've got a 95% chance of that portfolio making it for 30 years. If you're in 50% stocks or above, you're at probably a 95% chance or better, 93% chance or better. So, you know, that's one encouragement to 
investing in the market, even if you're hesitant to, even if you know you think in some ways it's riskier. You have to you have to weigh that kind of risk over time versus the purchasing power risk. The market is volatile, but over a you know five, 10, 15 year period, it's hard. It is hard to find a time when it hasn't outperformed inflation and taxes. Now, with the 4% assumptions, there are some problems. First of all, Bergen and, and the Trinity study. To utilize that 4% rule, you have to assume past is prologue in investment returns. If I look at returns over time, here's 20-year annualized returns, average return per year from 2001 to 2020. And you can see that real estate leads at 10% with equity at around 10%, general stocks, small cap stocks, small company stocks, about 9%. Let the dogs calm down here a little bit. Gave them a few words of encouragement. So consistently, okay. like I say, yes, ma'am. Moffat. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I gifted five memberships. And Brentwood gifted one as well, so we got six. And Very I still can't cool. person gifted. <laughs> I don't know why. That's beyond my beyond my skills or scope. And I'm trying. I was like, Carson, I'm trying, man. So back to market returns. If we look over right. the past 10 years. The S&P 500 is at 12% as of September. Over most, again, over most any 10, 15, 20-year period, the average return is going to be between 10 and 12%. And that includes bad years. So that has been simply a far better option than most other options. Now, there have been one-year periods with some steep losses. Five and even 10-year periods with very little movement. If you look at this from basically, and some of this is a little bit, a uh, little bit awkward, but say from 1900 up to, um, this is as of October 2023. You can see there's a period here during the Great Depression for 13 years, when if you bought at the absolute peak and waited till it came back to that peak, you know, it took you 20 years to recover. But if you were buying all along and were buying even at some of these lower points, you're probably looking at five years to recover. There was a period in the 70s, the stagflation of the, of the 70s, in which the markets kind of chopped sideways. And then obviously the subprime crisis. But again, notice this would presume that you put every dime in at the absolute peak and how long it would take that investment with no other investment to return to its same value. So if you look at this in relative terms, the risk of you doing that is pretty damn small. Now, second main problem is the horizon of 30 years. People are living longer, even with severe illnesses. Uh, I just found out the past year I'm diabetic. And so my life expectancy is supposedly 10 to 18 years now. Normally it would be to age uh, 85, so nearly 20 years. 
other information. My father was a two pack a day smoker. He died at 85 ish. I think really at probably a boredom. And we don't really know his exact age. He never had a birth certificate. His mom and dad called him different names. Wasn't really sure of his birth date. Had an older brother thought he remembered him being born in this one town in Missouri. They were sharecroppers. So they lived in people's barns and moved around harvesting crops for him. But he contacted the town and the town hall burned down in the late 40s. So everything prior to that was destroyed. My grandfather died was I'm sorry, my grandfather was a three pack a day smoker and a heavy drinker. So I don't know. How long ago did he quit? Um, about 30 years ago. That's big. Uh, mom died, mom died of Lou Gehrig's at age 65, but she was, you know, before it hit, she was very young, very healthy otherwise. So there's information I can use in planning my longevity, but none of it perfectly determinative. So the risk is outliving your savings. Now, this is a tough one, but, you know, one which makes being conservative, particularly with the withdrawals, particularly in the early years, more important. You know, you may also want to plan on working a little longer. Instead of retiring at 65, maybe look at 67 or 70 or go part time or find a side gig that you enjoy that can produce some additional income for you for years while you can and while you enjoy it. I saw a study years and years ago. I don't have it. I don't remember the name of it, but it said basically the average man who retires with nothing to go to, nothing to do specifically after he retired was dead within six to 12 months. So it's important to retire and have a purpose. You've got to have something to get up for in the morning. People need to feel useful and wanted. And I think that's a big problem among the elderly. So many of them don't feel that needed or wanted. And here's where you get back to attitude being critical. Well, I think that's kind of where, you know, my pop had issues because they were like, he said they wouldn't let me mow the yard anymore. They wouldn't let me do the things because I was older. And by older, he means like 90. <laughs> I'm like, you know, and we showed you that video um, on Tuesday or Saturday. I can't remember which with him mowing the yard. He was happy as a, a pig in poop. Um, yeah, he felt like he, he was doing something constructive. He, yeah, he needs to make new memories. He needs to do things that keep his mind going. Oh, lost a bud there but um no he needs to you know and i told him i said the reason your um memory doesn't seem to be catching up is because you're doing the exact same thing every single day you've got to shake it up you've got to make new memories i mean studies have shown that if you don't make new memories like during covid often we lost track of what day it was and what was going on and that's because there was nothing knew we were in our homes or we were walking on the same paths or doing the exact same thing. And it kind of messed with your head a little bit. So I try to give him I'm one thing to accomplish each day. That's a great idea. It oh, is. He does his own laundry. He loves it. I mean, he's just like, okay. Everybody needs to feel useful and wanted. They do. He loves puzzle books. He has a ton of them. And he also plays games on his his phone now, now that we got him a new phone that he can see. Um, it's a little bit larger than the one he had. I think he had like a 5.6 inch or something like that. Now he's got a 6.1, a little bit bigger. But um, he loves puzzle books. That is just, he's he loves crossword puzzles. He loves word searches he loves all the things he's he loves I th- all I think he's, 
Mm -hmm. I think he's gotten happier because he has somebody in his life now that loves him and va values him. And, you know, everybody ought to, ought to be loved and wanted. That's just big in the human condition. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you got to have at least someone that you know loves you and is not just trying to use you. Um for your finances or whatever, because I find that abhorrent. And um, he said, my mind was so great. I said, Pop, it is still great. You still have a great mind. And Clay's seen our text messages back and forth, and I know he can account for that. Yeah. Um, the Panay, Panay girl at churches, was, <laughs> you have churches chicken. There you go, man. Get you some churches. Yeah, he went he had to go get him some fried chicken. All right. Back to the 4% rule. Sorry. Talk, no, that's fine. Talking about, you know, problems or concerns with the implementation of the 4% rule. Both Bergen and Trinity assumed zero investment fees. That the returns experienced by the investor are the exact same ones as realized by the indexes being used by the S&P 500. Now, a lot of people don't realize the damage fees can do. Higher fees can significantly reduce the longevity of your funds. Commissions you pay, fees you pay. So you want to be aware of the fees you're charged to invest the money, to withdraw the money, or to maintain the account. I've closed every financial account that charged me fees. I was with Wells Fargo for years and they started slapping a, a, uh, a fee on one of my savings accounts that I had to come like an overdraft account. And I said to hell with that. And so I moved the money. Now the, all of this probably saves me 50 to $75 a month. And some people go, you know, that's, you know, that's nice. But the thing is, they don't realize how much that adds up to. On Just with this $75 a month, if I put it in basically a stock mutual fund over the next 20 years, that will add anywhere from sixty dollars to $75,000 to my account balance. And I'm telling you, that $75,000 in 20 years will be a whole lot better in my pocket than it will the bank's. I mean, I hate fees. I absolutely hate fees, especially in this day and age when there's so many other better options. You should hate them too, with a passion, especially when there are better options, cheaper. Well, I know that one of the banks, I can't remember, he does not charge overdraft fees anymore. I can't remember if it's City or JP Morgan. Um, I do know that. I'm sorry, I missed some of this. I'm still trying to figure out how to get Carson on the member list. Um, <clears throat> but I know that Congress encouraged the rest of the big banks to stop that. Well, part of the thing is like when banks oftentimes charge an overdraft fee, they will, if the check isn't huge, they'll cover the check so that the check doesn't actually bounce. Whereas if they don't charge money a fee, in the long run. Yeah. I hear Whereas you, but if, still. If they don't charge the fee, they're probably just gonna go ahead and bounce the check. So now another I guess criticism I have of the four percent rule and the way it was implemented by Bergen and Trinity is a lack of diversification. Now, let me say this. Diversification is just spreading out your investment among different types of investments. It's a risk-reducing strategy. You know, instead of just investing in American stocks, I might invest in foreign stocks. I might invest in real estate. I might invest in commodities or gold or whatever, Bitcoin. And Bergen, neither Bergen nor Trinity considered that. 
but for those people who are really concerned about investing in the, the risk of investing in the U.S. stock market, this may be a way to reduce your risk and still help you earn better returns. Now, by adding international investments or real estate investments, um, you will reduce the risk. Probably reduce your overall return a little bit but we're talking a percent or two, whereas your reduction in risk may be fairly significant to you. Maybe, you know, 5, 10, 20% reduction in risk. Now, there are times where you may not want to reduce risk. Some people teach diversification as a holy grail of finance, that everybody ought to be diversified. I don't believe that. There have been times in my life when I dumped everything in one uh, category or industry. Managing. Okay. So, um, were you talking to me or? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Just got thrown off a little bit here. I'm sorry. <laughs> not your fault. I'm the one that, you know, guys, I'm, I'm listening for creatures running around in my head, actually. Oh, I'm so, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to check out the, the rumble as well. No problem. So diversification, there are times when you don't want or may not want to diversify. You may think, for example, AI or healthcare has a tremendously bright future and you want to concentrate more of your investments in that. So it's really a matter of how concerned you are of risk and your expectations of the future of specific companies or industries or geographical regions. Now, in my, in my opinion, Clay, mm -hmm. I think risk is huge right now and unreliable. I mean, the stock market is high. I don't think it's going to be sustainable. That's my opinion, not yours. Um, and it's not financial advice. I just, I'm not sold on what we're being sold right now. Yeah, the market, you know, had a good week this week. Pretty damn good week this week. Mm -hmm. And the the thing that, you know, I was so excited about was Jay Powell, uh, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, came out and kind of alluded to the fact or mentioned that the Fed may, you know, cut rates, which is what the market has been waiting for for two years to hear those magic words, because the market since 2009 has become terribly addicted to free cash, the Federal Reserve handing out free cash to the major banks, which a good portion of that ends up in the stock market, the bond market. So, and housing. That's why you've seen all three assets have very high prices, a, a bubble even in, in the prices. Well, Can I interrupt the, you real quick? Sure. Do you think that the taxpayers should have bailed out the biggest U.S. banks in between 07 seven and 09? Yeah, I do. Why? Um well, one, there was no choice. We what, what literally, does that mean? well, we, most people don't realize this. How can I explain this? I've said often that banks don't handle losses well. Right. And in September of 08, Lehman Brothers failed. Mm -hmm. Went by, declared bankruptcy. It was a huge surprise to everybody. Well, Lehman had sold a lot of short-term paper, co commercial paper, kind of like a, a treasury bill, but from Lehman. Mm -hmm. And this paper was held by a lot of money market mutual funds. Now, money market mutual funds try to keep their price at a dollar and then pay interest off of that. But one of the, the major and the largest money market mutual fund was known as Prime Reserve Fund. Well, Prime Reserve held a ton of Lehman paper. So all of a sudden, that portion of their portfolio dropped to zero. 
they could no longer keep their price at a dollar. And so they had to drop it down to 96 cents per share. Well, if you're invested in a money market, you think it's stable. You want it to be safe, kind of it's like a bank be. deposit account. It's supposed to be. Traditionally is. Yep. Well, people started seeing prime reserve dropping. And so they called prime reserve and said, sell my shares, send me my money. And so prime reserve didn't have enough cash to meet all the withdrawal requests. So they had to start selling bonds and paper that they had. Well, in September of 08, the bond market was already depressed. And here you have the largest mutual fund in the country dumping bonds into an already depressed market. Well, supply and demand still law. As supply of the bonds was increasing without any increase in demand, prices started falling worse. So Prime Reserve might try to sell $10 million in bonds, hoping to get enough cash to meet $10 in withdrawal request. But due to the prices dropping in the market, they only got $9 million. Plus, they had additional withdrawal request. So now they had to sell $15 million. Well, out of that $15 million they wanted to get, they only got $10 million. So now they had to sell another $5 million to cover that, plus new request. Price kept dropping. So the more they sold, the more the price dropped. Does that make sense? It does, but I have, I have a, sorry, a side okay. question. Hold on. No, let me finish this first. But come back to me. So, I will. So other mutual fund investors started seeing prime reserve falling. And so they began to be concerned that their money market mutual fund, even if it didn't hold any Lehman, might start falling. So other money market mutual funds started receiving huge redemption requests. And so they had to start dumping bonds on the market which drove the prices down even further, which meant they had to sell more bonds, which drove the market down even further, which meant they had to sell. Are you getting the idea? This is That's called contagion. What we're doing now though, right? No, not yet. This is called <laughs> contagion. And contagion is the one thing that all banks, the Federal Reserve fears the most. Because when the prices start dropping the endless cycle panic sets in and it becomes an endless cycle we literally most people don't realize this we literally came within hours of trading bare skin rugs under a tree you would have your credit card and you'd be trying to buy groceries your credit card wouldn't work and you'd go well i know i've got money in the account so you try another card it doesn't work so you say, well, let me go to my ATM. You go to your ATM, your card doesn't work. It says no funds available. And you go, what the hell? I have $10,000 in that account. So you go around the corner to the bank. The doors are locked. You have no way to get cash. None of your cards work. No store will accept credit cards within a, an hour. No store will accept credit cards or checks, cash only. Now, so, this is when, hang mom, on. This is when I was um, working in a hair salon and we were a, um, what do you call it? We, we all shared in the expenses of the salon, right? Like we would, they would take all the expenses for the past year divide them up between how many of us were there, depending upon which time we were there. And then that was what we paid per week to be there. And Just like a little hippie commune. It was actually a very nice salon. Um, and I remember the guy that owned it came in <clears throat> and said, hey, guys, we might have a problem. We were like, what do you mean? He said, well, I had a lot of credit on my house, which I'd never used, and the bank just canceled it. This is 2008 9. 
I'm no longer allowed to even access it. He's like, that was like my safety in case like the AC went out. There was some major issue. We had to replace things, whatever. So that's also like when you're saying you're trying to use your credit and you can't. That was a huge thing for small business owners as well. Yeah. And, you know, banks can actually call loans in in 24 hour notice. Mm -hmm. So you may have a, a loan with a bank and they call you on the phone and say, hey, we need you to pay this loan off tomorrow. And you go, well, there's no way I can. I don't have the cash. And they go, find the cash. And so you come in the next day with one tenth of the amount of the loan. That's all you could get up. So they, they take that and write off 90% of the loan. Again, liquidity. Bank has no liquidity. And they have to keep dumping assets and keep calling in loans to try to meet liquidity requirements. So contagion is basically tantamount to economic destruction of the economy, complete total economic destruction. We literally would be trading bearskin rugs under a tree. Hey, Clay, I'm going to piss you off right now. No. <laughs> That's just mean. <laughs> That's just mean. It is mean. Clay wanted um, Bojangles after his surgery the other day, and I said, sorry, I got to go home. Yeah, I hate both of you. <laughs> so, you know, literally in, in September of 08, most people don't realize we literally came within hours of this collapsing economy and banking system. Like it's a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the government bailing out these banks, basically they had no choice because if they didn't, mm. there would have been complete economic failure. Now, also I hold that the government caused the subprime crisis. Yeah, but didn't they just um, delay economic failure i mean did they really no. fix anything no yeah well that's two separate questions but hold on okay i hold that government caused the subprime crisis because in 1985 you had uh clinton and cisneros and barney franks pelosi push through a revision to the 1978 community reinvestment act and this revision forced banks to issue subprime loans now banks historically have never wanted to make loans to people who couldn't pay them back they don't stay in business they don't handle losses well and that's what but a subprime loan is they had to if they ever wanted to merge or open up new branches because it came became part of the evaluation criteria excuse me got the hiccups a little bit here that chili is doing its trick, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's when banks started it issuing subprime loans. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cute little hiccup. Yeah, this might be really annoying here before long. Hold your breath real quick. Um, so from 96 to 99, they, they issued as few as they could. Well, in 1999, Howell Raines and, and Frank Johnson, who headed up Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to, while trying. you hold your breath, I'm going to interject here. I actually know the guy who wrote the programs um, for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I used to work for him and he kind of, he felt a little bit responsible because he said they never were concerned about the back end. All they wanted to know was the front end. Are we getting a name, a birth date, social security number, all that stuff? And they were not concerned about how that information on the back end was used or compiled. Or he's like, we did what they asked us to do, but it was a disservice to them. But we couldn't convince them to build up the back end. Well, let me give a little bit more background as to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Sally Mae, 
These are all GSEs, government sponsored enterprises. They're kind of a quasi private, quasi government agency. Their goal is to buy mortgages from a bank. Bank makes a hundred thousand dollar loan. Well, historically, it would keep that hundred thousand dollar loan on its books. It couldn't make, you know, didn't have the cash. Well, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are created. They buy this loan from the bank for $99,500. So now the bank has new money that it can lend out. And so banks found this process of lending out to be much more profitable than holding the loan itself because they get 1% of the, of the fee. So they sold the loans. They sold, sold, excuse me, sold the loans <laughs> to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who then bundled them up in an Into investment called a mortgage-backed security, security, MBA, mortgage-backed security. And other banks would buy these loans, these mortgage-backed securities. And when Freddie Mac and, and Fannie, Fannie Mae, Mae in 1999 started telling banks, we'll buy all the subprime loans you can produce, that just turned the spigot on. Banks all of a sudden had free money. They could make loans to anybody, anybody even if they couldn't pay them back. Oh, I had an ex-husband that some bought these, a house with no signature. Yeah, some of these loans were called ninja loans. Ninja. No income, no job. You didn't even have to have a job. You didn't have to produce proof of income. You walked into a bank. You had to show up. Say there's a, uh, a, a house in Malibu <laughs> overlooking the Pacific Ocean. I'm sorry about the hiccups. It's kind of cute, though. House overlooking the Pacific Ocean. I, I never get the hiccups, and I've had these all day, and it's irritating. Really as hell. And it's a, a million dollars, and you're a street person, you're a homeless person. So you go into the bank and say, Hey, I, I saw this house for a million dollars. I'd like to buy it. And the banker goes, Great. And he says, How much do you need? And the guy goes, A million dollars. And the banker goes, great. He says, well, how much do you make? And the guy goes, well, how much do I need to make? Banker goes, oh, well, the payment's going to be $6,000 a month. So you'd need to make $20,000 $20, a month. And, and the guy goes, no problem. And the banker goes, great, sign here. And that's really all that was to it. So the banker gives this guy the million-dollar loan. He buys the house. Six months later, he hasn't made a single payment. The bank calls him up and says, hey, we haven't received a payment in six months. We're going to have to foreclose. And the guy goes, but, but wait, this house has appreciated in value. It's now worth a million and a half dollars. And the banker goes, oh, really? He says, yeah. He says, I'd like to borrow a million and a half dollars. And the banker goes, well, how much do you make? And the guy goes, well, how much do I need to make? Bank goes up. Oh, well, the payment's going to be $9,000 a month. So you'd need $30,000. And the guy goes, no problem. The banker goes, great. Sign here. So the bank gives him a million and a half dollars. He pays off the million dollar loan. He's got $500,000 to live off of the next year. How cool is that? That is a very real story of what happened in many places. Ninja loans, no income, no jobs. It's just sheer stupidity. Absolute sheer stupid stupidity. So government encouraged banks to make these loans to people who couldn't pay them back. And remember, you had the dot-com crisis in 99, you had 9-11. The Federal Reserve kept interest rates down very, very lo low. Well, starting about 04, 
they started raising rates again. Well, a, a lot of these loans were adjustable rate loans. So when the rates started adjusting back to a more reasonable interest rate, four, five, six percent, a lot of homeowners found out they couldn't make the payments. And that's when you started seeing bank bank loan defaults increase to where in 05, 06, finally 07, you know, a lot of funds were holding these subprime mortgage-backed securities started seeing their investments fail. And particularly for banks who held them, it was devastating because it took a hit. They took a hit against capital. Sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I'm like, I want to cancel the show just because of the hic hiccups. Yeah. But there's, I can't do anything about them. I'm sorry. I apologize. Then the more I try to fight them, the harder they get. Hold anyway, your breath. I did. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. Now, all right, back to 4% rule. Anyway, does that answer your question? Yes. Why do I think the banks should have been bailed out? One, because government caused the problem. <laughs> Two, because there was no choice. We would have had complete and utter economic devastation. I get that. It would have been worse than the than the Great Depression. So um, my problem um, is that out of all those CEOs and people who knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. not one of them went to jail. Not one of them had to surrender. You know, hell, Reigns and Johnson at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They should have. They, in in two thousand and one, they got a hundred and fifty million dollar bonus. 170 million dollar bonus because they were selling all these mortgages. They should have been under the jail. That's my problem is that nobody went to jail for this. And a lot of people knew what the hell they were doing and what they were leading up to. There was an article in the New York Times in 1999 talking about the subprime failure that was going to come. informed people understood what was going on. You saw, I've seen the, the movie, the big short. Oh yeah. You know, once people certain informed people started seeing what was going on, they tried to position themselves to take, take advantage of it. And that's kind of what we encourage on this show. Not that I'm going to turn all of y'all to Michael into a Michael Burry or that I'm a Michael Burry. But I believe information and better understanding of the markets helps you make far better decisions and understand better what's going on with your money. So you have less chance of being screwed. Anyway, 4%. Why I'm rule. laughing about the hiccups is because he never, ever, ever has them. And the fact that he got them like right now online is just because it's so annoying to him. Forgive me, I'm his roommate. I find that actually kind of funny. It, yeah. I appreciate y'all being sweet. Um, I've tried, to, I've gifted 10 memberships. Um, and I know Sandra is in here because um, she got one. I know she's had a rough day. Sandy, we love you. Very, yeah, very sorry. Yeah, no details. yeah, I don't know the details, but when Ellen says somebody's had a rough day, I take her word for it. Um, now, another concern that may have with the 4% rule is your, ma is your matching stable withdrawals with volatile assets. Now in finance, there's this, in accounting, there's this concept called matching principle. You kind of match the duration and the volatility of your assets to, 
to the appropriate liabilities. Your liability in this case is your series of payments that are owed or taken out. The asset is obviously the investment itself. And they should be fairly well matched in terms of risk, volatility, duration, whatever. And that's not a concern in this. That's just not a concern. You know, theoretically, the assets and liabilities don't match. So all I can say here without going hobnob, all academic kind of like, is screw the theory of matching. It doesn't work. So how's that for an explanation? That's about the best I can do there. So when playing with the numbers, using uh, S&P 500 index fund, using intermediate investment grade AA bonds, including inflation, if we lower the estimate to 3 or 3.3% in terms of your withdrawal, the funds would last for 40 years. If at least 50% are invested in stocks. If the record of the stock market for the past 75 years continues on the same path. Now, a big consideration is can you delay taking out funds for the first year, two years, three years? The more years you delay taking out funds, obviously, the longer the portfolio can stretch. Stretch it into 50 years. Now, admittedly, if you retire at 70, living until you're 120, chances are slim. But for me, the 50 years is kind of a proxy for the potential of having bigger non-budgeted expenses. You might have a, a home repair that you need to do. You might have an ex expensive car repair, something over and above your normal budget, monthly budget that you put together, you know, at the beginning of the show. So, and I'm not even assu assuming that anyone wants to leave a survivor benefit, that you have a spouse that you want to, you know, receive the benefits or kids, excuse me, kids that you want to receive benefits. So none of that. But that's why I'm, you know, kind of pushing, you know, understand your situation. And you may think 30 years has you covered. And that's great if you do. But at least you're thinking of it. You're aware of some of the other considerations. You're aware of some of the inputs into, into that decision. You're not just taking it on blind faith. Now, in terms of... The investments, let's take a look at a few of the potential choices or items. Here is a page that shows the invest, investment grade bond effective yields. Now, investment grade bonds, bonds are rated based on their likelihood of default with triple A being the safest. Very, 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 very little, no chance of the company going bankrupt. It's like a blue Double chip a. stock. Even safer. Okay. Um, you know, what are the chances are that Coca-Cola is going to go bankrupt? Slim, Slim and none. none. Yeah. So, so that kind of thing. Double A is just a step below that. Still very, very, very little chance they're going bankrupt or have any financial issues. So I would generally recommend probably double A bonds. They're safe, but you get a little higher return. Now, how much higher? If I look here on this page, it gives me some examples. For example, here's a triple A corporate in index yield, 4.5%. If I go down, I've got double A. Can you, can you blow that up a little bit? So uh, let's see. Is that a little better? The world can see it. Or at least the, the graph or I don't know how you're. I can't move the page. That's as much as I can blow it up. Okay. 
So right here in this corner, it's 4.5, 4 4.49% for AAA. If I get double A, I've got 4.67. So I've got roughly 20 basis points. Now, if I go down to single A, I've got 5.04%. So I'm nearly half a percent higher than triple A. And the last one would be triple B. This is the last rung of investment grade. Pension plans, banks have to invest in quote unquote investment grade securities. So that's triple B or above. So triple B, single A, double A, triple A, with triple A being the safest. Wait, so pensions have to invest in triple B? Or is above. Is that what you just said? Okay. Or above. But the yield is better. I'm trying to actually your list down with my mouse and that's not going to work but yeah sorry um, about that <laughs> okay um so you've got 5.41 percent with triple b versus 4.49 percent with triple a so you've got nearly a full percentage point difference so where's your risk I'm just saying, what are you comfortable with? Because the 4.49 will probably stay around there, but the triple B might not. Yeah, the, the triple B is an investment grade security. The companies mm -hmm. are pretty solid, pretty stable. You know, if I was tracking the economy clo closely and I wasn't concerned about increasing default rates, say from banks, which right now I probably would be, so I would probably stay away from triple B. I would probably yeah, I would look too. at double A. But if the economy turns around, interest rates drop a little bit, um, banks get out of this, you know, uh, deposits fleeing mode, there are times when I would be in triple B if I thought the what, economy was on solid footing. What do you think that time span is going to be between um, – the economy getting on solid footing. Oh, I don't know. It's at least a, a year or two away. And that depends okay. on, it depends on who gets elected, what policies to, you know, rule who like mm -hmm. Powell's term is up in a year. Powell right. is very hawkish. He's keeping rates higher. He wants to destroy inflation. He doesn't want to pump free money anymore. He's always believed that was wrong. Well, in a year, he's up for replacement. And if he's replaced by somebody like, uh, what's his name? He's the Minneapolis governor. He's very dovish. I don't know. Then rates would be cut very quickly. The Fed would probably start going back to pumping free money to the banks and that's really what created all the economic mess we're in or was a big contributor to the economic mess we're in. So how do we... So I think that would ultimately do far more damage to the economy and we keep it down 20, for longer. We had 20 years of almost zero interest rates, correct? Mm, yeah. Okay, so how... Like 2000. How do... That is never sustainable, in my opinion. No, it distorts risk and return. So You're how how, how do you balance how do you balance that out? How does the U.S. balance that out? I don't understand really necessarily what you mean by balance it out. It has all sorts of implications in terms of funding. Well, I talk about stay, zombie companies. It can't stay at zero forever granted we've had like a year of higher interest rates you can't bring it back down to nothing correct oh you can well i mean technically yes you can but what is a healthy interest rate to keep the economy booming without hurting the economy well, the thing is, people have gotten so addicted to lower interest rates, they don't know what a healthy rate is anymore. 
Right. It's like people are, are crying about a 7% mortgage. Well, historically, from 1971 to 2020, the average mortgage rate is 7.79%. Right. So and historically, 22% a 7%, in the 80s. Yeah, historically, a 7% mortgage rate is normal. Mm -hmm. But people are so used to 3% rates, 4% rates, that they think 7% is just obscene. They don't have any real concept of risk and return. So having the low interest rates greatly distorts that relationship between risk and return. The Fed can manipulate that relationship, but ultimately the price it? has to be paid. You let the market balance it. You don't right now everybody is waiting on the Fed to set the interest rates. Historically, the market has set the interest rates. The Fed has just tweaked a little bit to adjust. But since, you know, 2009, the Fed pumped, what was it, 10 or $11 trillion into the economy. Its balance sheet had been zero forever. If you look at the graph, it goes on for, you know, 50 years like this, then all of a sudden goes vertical. Now they're like, Print some more. Yeah. Printing presses go burr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what got us in this mess. You've also got the fiscal policy, government spending. You know, in October, we borrowed $94 trillion. I'm sorry. So, blah, 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 blah. $94 billion. <laughs> this past month in November, we hit three hundred and sixty-four billion. I'm trying to remember the exact number, three hundred and fourteen billion. It's a sad state of affairs, Klein. So that's annualized borrowing of three point seven trillion dollars a year. And now our our interest is one point seven trillion. That's increasing our national debt ten percent a year. Yeah, and that the the implications in terms of interest expense, like several shows ago, I mentioned that you know we're currently paying forty fifty percent of everything we collect in income taxes in interest, mm -hmm. and within a year year and a half, that could approach a hundred percent. Just an in interest. We're not paying welfare. We're not paying defense. We're not paying anything else. Just interest with every tax dollar work that's collected in income taxes. And so we're just in my opinion, low past that. That doesn't look good for Social Security or retirement or pretty much anything. What it doesn't. Well, Social Security, they still print money. Flip side well, is but, inflation. <sighs> Inflation will go through the roof. Yeah. Because government will have to print more money to pay the bills. We've become a third world nation. We're borrowing money to pay interest on the debt. Which just creates more debt and more interest. Yes, it's third world nation. Right now, inflation in Argentina is 140% a year. And they've Ours been is, practicing that for, for a number of years. Well, our GDP, or at least two weeks ago, was 120 no, Over. I'm talking about their inflation mm -hmm. rate. Yeah, I know. Our inflation rate is 4%. Their inflation rate is 140%. Oh, fuck me. Sorry. That's yeah. awful. So, you know, if spending and borrowing debt, interest, all that continues unabated, then that's where we're headed. We're seriously screwed. I mean, ideas have consequences and, you know, you can only be stupid for so long before it really starts hurting. Well, I saw the, um, the Argentinian, is that correct? Yeah. Um, the new president, really? put up this board and said, nope, no more of this, no more of gender studies, no more of all the pronouns, no more of anything that is going to cost us money. This is just BS. And we're going to get back to like what actually matters. Yeah. The only thing is it's going to be painful. 
there is no simple, quick, easy solution. What he's doing is going to be painful. Um, I believe it ultimately it. will work, but it will be painful. And I don't know if the people will give him enough time to clean up the mess. We have a problem with StreamYard. I'm going to try to fix it real quick. So forgive Okay. Well, nice seeing you, Ellen. All right. So just trying to give you an idea of the different uh, differences in investment options. Next, take a look at treasuries. Treasury yield curve rates. Now, if we go down here, 12, 15, 23, that's what we're looking at. And what you've got is one month, three month, six month, then the one year. So these are one month, three months, six months, nine months. The one year rate, 4.4. You've got the two year, three year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year. So this just shows you the comparison. Right now, the short-term rates are higher or significantly higher than the long-term rates. This week, we saw a lot of people buying the long-term. And if you remember, we talked about the teeter-totter, how interest rates and bond prices are inverse. So as interest rates fall, bond prices increase. And it's supply and demand. As people buy more and more bonds, the prices will increase, driving the rates down. So on the long term, you see the rates have dropped, you know, fairly significantly over the past week. Uh, the prior week, they were 4.3%. Now they're 4%. 30 basis points is a pretty huge drop in the long end. But the reason is you've got people thinking that the Fed's going to start cutting rates. And so they're trying to lock in the longer rates. So the idea is if you buy a 10-year treasury, you get 3.91%. A five-year treasury is 3.91 as well. Remember that corporate bond, AA, 4.67. So the corporate bond is about 70% basis points higher, seven-tenths of a percent higher than the Treasury. And it's still very, very safe. But if you wanted to go for the ultimate in safety, that would be the Treasury bonds. Because the Treasury is always going to pay you back. They own the printer. So they can always print off more money. Now in Canada... We talked about – oh, come on now. There we go. We talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, retirement plans in Canada. And once you reach age, was it 70? You have to roll everything over into RRIF, an investment fund that starts paying you out over a 20-year period. Well, one option there would be a GIC. Guaranteed Investment Contract. And these are like um, bonds, but they're with private companies. And here you see a one-year, three-year, maximum of five-year rates. So if you wanted a five-year GIC in Canada, you'd be looking probably around 4.2 to 4.5%. Royal Bank of Canada is offering 4.5%. If you wanted to go shorter, you know, the one year is paying 5.2. Flip side is in a, in a year, where are interest rates going to be? So those are decisions you need to make. Even though the short-term rate right now is higher, you may want to lock in a higher rate if you expect interest rates to decline over the next year. My personal view is likely that the Fed will, for appearances sake, make one cut maybe in the spring or summer. But Powell has stated repeatedly, higher for longer, higher for longer. He doesn't want to recreate the 1970s. If you, if you look at inflation in the 1970s, it peaked high, fell down, and then the Fed backed off and inflation kicked back up again. So 
Jay Powell doesn't want to repeat that mistake, and he keeps saying higher for longer. Now, in terms of stock funds, I'll go back to our old faithful here, Fidelity. And this is, they have a mutual fund search engine. Now, mutual fund. Mutual fund is just simply a group of investors that pool their money together, hire a manager, and the manager makes all the investment decisions. And you can get mutual funds that invest in stocks, invest in bonds, money market. Um, you can get them at stocks, invest in specific industries like healthcare, like AI or whatever. So I went to their criteria and I basically looked at you know, commodities and stock funds, all different types. I look for funds with a minimum investment of zero. So you could start, you could open one of these funds with $50. I looked for a fund that was rated by this group called Morningstar, at least four out of five. So four stars, five star funds. And I looked for funds that consistently had above average returns with low expenses. So I'm a little picky in terms of what I what I invest in. You? <laughs> and so I got, you know, these different funds. For example, energy. And it gives me the year to date minus 0.1%. Well, that's not exciting, but if I look at the 3 year and more importantly the 5 year, 39%, 10% semiconductors which is a technology fund this year 76% 3 years 20% a tech bubble 5 year 29% you've got energy you know 40% over 3 years 10% for 5 years sorry i'm yawning no that's fine you've got small cap funds you know uh 3 year 16% 5 year 10% You've got large cap funds. These are large international corporations. One year is 14%, three year 13%, five year 13%. Um, brokerage firms, financial firms. Brokerage firms are always going to make money. One year, 9%, 12%, 14%. So then you've got different value stocks. You've got financial. You've got you know, all sorts of different types of funds. Here's a S&P 500 index fund. One year, 13%, three year, 9.7, five year, 12. So you've got this little search capability with, with Fidelity. You can go through 3,000 different funds and find funds that match your specific interest. Can you hang on one sec? Sure. Hey guys, if y'all are here, if you have not, please like, subscribe it costs you nothing and share the video if you wish um, it helps us a lot like a lot lot um we never ask that but i i implore you please <laughs> let's make that a thing we're trying to improve look i got the logo up there how cool is that um so it, it, you know ask your friends to just like the video that's all you know it just, it really helps us. Yeah. We, you know, we're always looking to improve. If you've got some suggestions or something you'd like to see or, or see different, go, let us the know. YouTube Do the please, YouTube please, things. Oh, uh, another option. For example, um, dividend paying stocks. These are stocks of individual companies but that pay relatively high dividends. So I went to I went to Yahoo and went to this little screener section and went down to equity screener. And then I put in I'm looking for companies that have dividend growth, have increased their dividend for at least 3 year 3 years consecutively. I'm looking for companies that have a forward dividend rate of greater than 4% and a forward yield of greater than 4%. So I'm really looking for a 4% or better dividend paying stock that has grown for at least three years running. And I get all these companies coming up. And if I click on some of them, for example, Chevron, 
Chevron right now is paying a dividend of 4% or 6% based on what their forward earnings are. That's a pretty solid rate for a huge, stable company. Oh, I'm back up. Please. 25th, 2024. How do they know? That's when they announce their earnings. That's just a yeah. press conference. Okay, gotcha. I was like, what? What? If I go to IBM, nobody talks about IBM, but IBM is still cranking on and they're pretty big in AI. Right now, they're paying a 4% dividend, 6% expected. Um, how about Duke Energy? Yeah. Well known energy company. 4.2%. Like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they littered our, never mind, our waterways. 3M company, another company you don't hear much from, but this company's a cash cow, 5.61% dividend. Dude, they make post-its. They make post-its. Who when it doesn't use a post-it? Yeah. Note. Everybody needs post-its. They're all over my house about the um investment video for you, Melissa. Because Clay has to remind me to do all of the <laughs> post-it thingies. <laughs> always the YouTube things. Yeah, I gotta do the the video things. So if you want dividend paying stocks, you know, you have a couple different aspects here. One, the stock price probably won't do great things, but it'll still increase some. And you've got a good four or five percent dividend regular. I can't say into perpetuity, but you know, most of these companies have been doing this type dividend for decades. Entergy, 4.4.5% dividend. So there's a lot of different investment alternatives. You know, the goal is to find investments that you're comfortable with, you know, build your portfolio, investments you can track easily and adjust to fit your current, you know, view or position or comfort level, whatever it is. You have a general idea of how long you want it to last and to be able to to determine your level of withdrawals. Now, in Canada, there are legal requirements for minimum withdrawals once you hit age 70. Uh, there are also minimum levels in the U.S. once you hit age 73. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in, the US, in Canada, it's a 20-year life. In the U.S., if, when you, if you turn 73 next year or later, your distribution period is 27.4 years, okay? This applies to 401ks as well as your IRA. And the rate drops every year. So you have to recalculate your minimum withdrawal from your fund every year. Drops every year? Yeah. The longer you live, the shorter your life expectancy. Well, I get it, but the longer you live, the shorter, shorter your life, life expectancy. expectancy. Yeah. That's an oxymoron. No. It works. The longer you live, the shorter your life. Huh? Yeah, right now, you know, my life expectancy is 18 years, let's say. In five more years, my life expectancy will be 15 years. So grandpa's an anomaly. No. The long 96. His life expectancy may be five years. Yeah. He's well, when he was 65, it was 20 years. Well. So the longer you live, the shorter your life expectancy. But it's such a curious pension haven't. No. Diminished. They don't. That doesn't yeah. apply to this. Sorry. I was, Melissa's giving me the guilt trip. <laughs> don't worry, Clay does every single day. I mean, it did take him a long time to get it. So. And I'm not punishing him for getting taking forever. I'm, I'm just not going to say anything. Melissa, you will get your Christmas wish if it, I swear. I might just do it Christmas morning. How about that? So to calculate <laughs> the minimum percentage of your distribution, it's real simple. You just take your total funds and divide it by the years for your age. 
So if you're 73, it's 27.4 years. So that gives you the amount. For example, if you have $200,000 put aside and your distribution period is 27.4, you divide 200,000 by 27.4. That gives you $7,299 that you have to withdraw that year. You can take it out either as a lump sum or you can divide it into monthly amounts or quarterly amounts, whatever you want to. Now, the flip side is you don't have to spend it. You can take that $7,000 and put it in, a, in another savings account. You still have to pay taxes on it, but you don't have to blow it. So you can still, you'd have to draw it from the qualified plan, the IRA or the 401k or the RIFF, but you're not required to spend it. You can still save what's ever left after taxes. So, you know, I hope that helps. I hope that helps you plan. I hope that helps give you a little bit better idea of, you know, how to manage your retirement, some of the different options in your retirement, and, you know, gives you a better understanding of whether or not the 4% rule applies to you. You know, again, I would urge conservative as you can with the withdrawals, particularly in the early years because you never know what unknown expenses you have or what your ex life expectancy may be. Um, but I hope that helps a little bit. Melissa, <laughs> do the elves have to pay taxes? What kind of retirement plan does Santa offer? Um, you get to live the North Pole uh, tax-free, but you have to work 24, seven, three, six, five, except for one week of the year. I'm thinking the best retirement plan he offers is Quan. Oh, Melissa, I have a friend who had a ton of little of Aussie puppies. You know, if you got anybody that wants one, hook me up. Aussie puppies. That's a handful. Yeah. No <laughs> I got this baby. She's enough for me. Yeah, you got two of them. Yeah. All right, just a few comments on the market before we call it a night. And, you know, obviously, I've already mentioned a lot of people were excited about the uh, J Powell comments this week, expectation of the Fed cutting rates soon. You know, what most people don't understand or ignore was on an inflation adjusted basis, the market is still down 12%. You know, prices have gone up. But the market hasn't matched that inflation. Brentwood, how was the second surgery? Pretty good so far. I, uh, I'm still wearing the dead sexy glasses, which is probably more irritating than the hiccups. I've got to keep them above his ears. They don't rub. Yeah. Um, but I get my first treatment to adjust the lens. This Bionic week, lenses. yeah, I'll basically sit down and they'll use UV light to tweak and adjust to shape the lenses so that they better match my um, structure of focal. my focal point on the retina. So hopefully when all said and done, if I keep them protected and uh, they adjust them right, then I'll have practically 2020 vision at a distance and be able to do most reading without glasses. So the whole process should take three or four more weeks. And if, if I can keep these glasses on him for three or four more weeks, it'll be a Christmas miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I forget to change him. Why don't you let him know? Because uh, Rob is not the best um, communicator. No, I but think they are the cutest. They've got red merles and blue merles and black tries, and it, they are the cutest darn things. I delivered them. They are precious. They're medium size shepherds, Aussies. They're cute when they're pups. <laughs> That's all dog. I'm saying. Every dog is cute when they're a pup. You are <laughs> back and far, far behind. Hello, guys. Still mad at you for getting chicken and not sending me any, but no, we'll talk about that later. Biscuit, 
That's what you want. I want the honey. I definitely want the honey biscuits. <laughs> you know who makes really good biscuits? Bojangles. Red Lobster. I, do we only have one of those? Cheese biscuits. biscuits. They're cheese bis biscuits for, for the ages. There is no Red Lobster in this town. I'm going to get the recipe. Um. I can make some cheddar biscuits. A few other things in the in the uh, in the market. We're seeing increased defaults on student loans. <laughs> How cool is that? I saw a little video. I thought about playing it, but it's basically this young girl talking about she's not going to repay her student loan. What are they going to do? Um, <laughs> ruin her credit rating so she can't buy a house that she can't afford anyway. And you know, talked at the beginning of the video about attitude that your attitude determines how you make financial decisions. And this girl is making bad financial decisions because of a bad attitude. And I understand the frustration. I understand, you know, paying 50% in rent or mortgages or houses being unaffordable. But no, you don't understand. times change. Times change. And, you know, we're already seeing housing prices drop. But you know, what can they do? Well, yeah, they can ruin her credit. So she won't even be able to buy a car for the next decade. They can garnish her wages, which all of a sudden they'll take whatever they want out of her wages. And there's not a damn thing she can do about it. It also hurts her ability to get jobs in industries that run background checks, like the finance industry, lending, banking, security jobs, government jobs. Again, you know, the attitude, you know, just you, you notice people's attitude. You see more and more people getting increasingly angry and distrustful of the system, though it's, a, you know, it's a system they voted for. So let me ask you, chaos, is it increasing or decreasing? Increasing. You know, is risk increasing or decreasing? Increasing. So you know, wants to come say hi. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, where, where I stand, but, um, you know, I'm not going to say my crystal ball is any better than anybody else's, but there are just certain trends I see that to me don't bode well. And Britain would say cheddar biscuits, yum. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, small companies are still reporting sales declines. If you look at, at the graph, Here is 2020, and you see the COVID drop. Well, it bounced back right after COVID, but what has been happening since? Down, 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 down. This is not a recent thing for this past three. This is a three-month average. For the past three months, retail sales for small businesses, which are the backbone of the economy, are down 17%. That's huge. This is Slava. Yeah. That is the problem right now. Interest rates are so high that monthly mortgage payments are not affordable to many, especially if you have to pay student loans and people have to live somewhere. I just saw where homelessness has reached an all time high in the country. Um, and student loans, you know, college kids don't understand, they are not told that they will practically graduate with a mortgage after college because of their student loan payment. You know, we, and, and we get them, you know, they'll rack up a hundred or even $200,000 in debt for a degree that they can't get a job with. That, that's the problem is they can't get a job that will pay enough for them to actually be able to afford the student loan plus housing yeah. plus food plus and the interest rate payment plus gas plus everything else yeah and the interest rate on student loans is not cheap it's eight percent so that is not a cheap loan and and students are encouraged to sign up for these things and spend them with no idea what's what that's doing to their future it's criminal um, I've known students who have taken out a student loan in spring to use spend on their spring vacation. Yeah, and, and Dasislava Tsankova, if I mispronounced your name, please let me know and give me 
um, a better pronunciation. I'm sorry. Yes, if we <laughs> if we butcher anybody's name, please let us know. You're not going to hurt our feelings. We, we want to, you know, we want to try to pronounce your name correctly. I mean, I I, I butchered Clay on Brentwood. He said chick. I said chic. It's <laughs> it still looks like chick to me. <laughs> But either way, she's cool either way. Absolutely. So. Oh, head on the desk. Bottom line, there's still, you know, a lot of things going on in the economy. I go by Sophia. Yeah. Well, there you go. Easier. <laughs> <laughs> this is love. We'll, uh, we'll try to remember that. Yeah. But thank you for being here. Very much. Appreciate yeah, appreciate all of y'all joining us. Those that have been with us through the show. Um, those that will join us on Replay Crew. You're very welcome. I, you know, I appreciate you asking questions. That's I really kind of enjoy this because the goal is to try to do some good, try to help answer questions or help people who, you know, have questions. And so, you know, thanks for asking. And I hope you'll continue to. Or if, you know, I say something that doesn't make sense or that's confusing, let me know. I, I have a lot of students who are hesitant to ask. And I mean, I give them my cell phone number. I'll ask them in class 50 times. Do you understand what I'm saying? And um, you can always contact us at Moffat on Money. Moffett, M-O-F-F-E-T-T-O-N-M-O-N-E-Y at gmail.com. And then at Moffett on money on Twitter. So please, I mean, you know, use that. We, we find more things to talk about and things that interest you that you might not be willing to talk about openly online, but you know, we, we want to know what you guys want to know. Yeah, we have done a number of shows that were spurred by questions from from viewers or, you know, people that had a question. So keep them coming. Um, and we enjoyed being here with you tonight. Thank you very much. We love uh, you guys. Tulu and Chunk, send their love. Tulu's and Quan. We're happy to be here. <laughs> I hope all of y'all have a most blessed weekend. Hope you will join us Tuesday night for uh, Tuesday night Q&A. And, and until send then. Send us some questions, please. I want to wish you all a good night. Thank you again. Our Love time is up. We thank you for yours. Good night, everybody. Blessings night, to Melissa. you. Good night, Sophia. Good night, Carson. Good night, Carson. Good night, John Boy. And good night. <laughs> Marianne. Replay crew. We still love you. Yeah, we do. See y'all. No. <laughs> Live is better. Y'all have a good one.